Welcome to another edition of the Real Estate Interview with The Real Deal. I'm Hatan Sultani, your host. And today I have with me Nick Romito. He's the founder and CEO of VTS. VTS started off as a, as a video touring company for commercial landlords, but it's since evolved into probably the most active, probably one of the biggest and most interesting companies in the sort of the cloud big data space. But really what we're going to focus on today is the evolution of the office building in the market we're in how the office building can adapt, how the office industry can adapt, and how Nick's company might help with that. So Nick, thanks for being with The Real Deal. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a, a fun ride and, and you've had a front row seat for a long time, so. And when you guys started and companies like you, when, when PropTech started becoming a thing, there were a lot of what I would call companies that were startups that were not endemic to real estate. So founders didn't really have a background in real estate. They were more from the tech side, so it's like, Hey, you know, I just came in from the Bay Area and let me tell you how this works. A lot of those guys have sort of dropped off the map. So what changed? They were more your traditional, like, I see a problem in a space and thing, right? yeah, I'm so smart, I'm going to fix it. Yeah. And the venture people thought that was great. They liked that, right? It's okay. These are people understand how to build product. The real estate community kind of was like, literally, I don't understand a word you're saying to me in a meeting. And so I would never buy what you're selling. I mean, our, our industry is uniquely good at smelling bull crap. Let's talk a little bit about where we are now. I don't want to get into like, is the office around? Let's assume the office is around. Let's assume at least a good majority of people are coming back in some capacity, fair? For what, sure. What, what, does, what does it look like? You're, you're, there is definitely, the office asset was seen as a boring, stable, cash flowing asset, which is why pension funds love office buildings in New York, LA, et cetera. You have to question that assumption, at least like regular value, sort of consistent growth that has to be questioned at the moment. So what's your take on it as someone who's having these conversations all the time and trying to help landlords? Well, I think the first thing is getting as close to your customer as you can, mm -hmm. right? It's, and it's, it's one thing that our customers, the landlords have not been really good at, right? They haven't been. I mean, their, their relationship is typically with the broker or maybe the head of real estate mm -hmm. for a company. But it's not with the everyday end user who's in that building all day and night who has real complaints or issues. Um, and so for us, it's funny, we, we had pretty strong conviction on this kind of like tenant engagement space about two years ago. Um, it, was the, it was the first time we had seen a category in prop tech get so much hype so fast and see some venture capital pour into it. But we saw our customers pay attention. Uh, mm -hmm. And that kind of like put our spotty sense up. And then we saw the number of companies grow and the number of our customers start paying more attention. And we start to run a process where like, okay, we've got pretty strong conviction. We want to be in the space. It makes total, it makes way more sense for that thing to be a feature in VTS than a standalone product. Because as you know, landlords and their teams are very busy. They have short attention spans and they're not going to going to log into 14 things. And so um, we basically ran an RFP and said, we're going to buy, we don't want to build it. There's, there's, just, there's too much kind of blood, sweat, and tears have done in these businesses. Let's, let's buy the and best you've one. Been through those fights before enough. 100%. Yeah. So we, we literally said, we don't need the best sales and marketing team. We have a 12 billion square foot channel of buildings. We need the best product. And so ran an analysis, did, you know, a lot of diligence. And it was very clear that this thing called Rise, who had the least amount of marketing, was by far the best technology platform. So we, we, Work, I fell in love with the founders. They're, they're actually one of the only founders of all these space of these companies that have a real real estate background. So to your earlier question that you, you see it in the product it is it, their product is different because of that experience. And so I think that bleeds true through all these categories. And you were at the scale now, Nick, at this, in this point in your journey where you can, where you have that ability to say, are we going to m a this in a, in a way, or are we going to build this? For sure. And it's, 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 it's nice to not have to build everything, right? Because, you know, the same passion and, and obsession that we have with leasing and asset management, people have for other things. And there is a, there is a real multiple you can apply to that that is extremely valuable. And so as we thought about, like, how do we really help our customer, the landlord, get ready for whatever the new normal is, this felt like probably the one of the most critical things to do mm -hmm. was to, to give them an application that allowed their end customer, the tenant, to have a much better experience in the building, but also allowed ownership to really keep a pulse on 
the happiness or sentiment of that end customer. Let's say Rise, I don't know how far the integration has gone because the, the acquisition is super fresh, but like, let's say we're, let's say it's in your system and it's, it's spitting out these insights. Yeah. What happens next? Like what, what's the process from there for you to go to a Fisher or a Rudin or a Blackstone and say, Hey, I think we have something here that you should think about. So what, what does that look like if you can? Data for data's sake isn't all that valuable, right? And, and, and because our customers, you know, with the exception of maybe a few, don't have data science teams or, or analysts who are focused on customer sentiment or things like that, they need their, their partner, their technology partner in a VTS to actually help them make sense of that information. So in your exact example, Seeing just seeing a, 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 a tenant's sentiment in a building in isolation is interesting, but it's not that actionable. If I see that compared to other trends about that tenant, like um, how their existing rent compares to market and when their lease expiration is, well, now I've got something to do. I know that this tenant is not happy. Their lease expires in nine months. And by the way, they're paying 30 bucks below market. We've got a lot of work to do. Right. That is an actionable. Right data-driven outcome. Or the flip side of it, which is these tenants are extremely happy and they're, you know, they're at par. There's not really much room for them to play hardball because you know that they're super happy in this percent. There's two sides of the coin, right? right? But if you can't see that and you can't use that data, you know, in, in, in addition to the other stuff you have to know about that company, it just kind of gets, you know, falls by the wayside. So that was our, that was our conviction. We'll, we'll see how that, how that plays out. Uh, you said something about 12, when we did an article, I think it was, you were nearing that 1 billion square foot mark when we had talked. Now you're, you said you're at 12 billion square feet. That's across 85,000 odd buildings. And that's not obviously just not the US, that is global. Right. So I'd love to zoom out if we can and talk a little bit about this, this idea I've been kicking around. Yeah. Have you ever been to 11 Madison Park, the, the restaurant? Yes. Okay. So there... They are sort of the, the extreme example of like concierge dining, right? You walk in, they know your preferences. They know what, you know, they know your kids' names. They know yeah. that your, you know, your son may want his hot dog cut up and, you know, on, on a plate. And they, they use that experience to, you know, make the service at this incredible level. You don't, you don't even think about the food once you're there. You're just, you're transported into this realm, right? Now, Across your portfolio, across all the action you've seen, is there any is there any hopeful sign of like truly I don't know if we want to call it concierge commercial real estate where the landlord knows your preferences so intimately that they can do stuff that makes you happier that makes you just like wow you're kind of going deeper now into this tenant engagement thing, um, which by the way is fine we just bought a we just bought a company there but that is exactly. Those are the kinds of things that they already do that, that to be honest, I, I wasn't aware of how valuable it was till we started our diligence. They have this really amazing uh, patent on beacon technology mm -hmm. where, you know, That's they can the do things like, what's that? Is that the tracking tech? Like It is, tracking? correct, correct. So, you know, they, they know what parts of the amenities or the restaurants or cafes within a building are really getting used and at what times like this is the kind of things they're doing where it's like you're, you're actually taking the aggregate level data not personal data but you're aggregating it and saying there's an opportunity here to give back to the customers that is totally to your point feels bespoke to them you know blue chip landlords don't necessarily have that kind of intimacy with their tenant and i think no. I'm wondering if that's changing at all it, it's changing i think it's changing at a slow pace um you know the vast majority of owners still i don't think they're they know they want to get there they don't know how um you know because it, it does take you know obviously the technology helps but like all things it's still 70 percent people that have to make that process change happen for you um you know i think the the thing that makes us hopeful is you're seeing owners hire kind of new roles they haven't historically had um whether those are people who are like literally head of customer experience or mm -hmm. Um, even just a CTO, there wasn't really a CTO role across these landlords, data science teams, right? Like some of the bigger owners now have major data science initiatives, which is great. So they're, they're really trying to figure out how to make this stuff come to life. And at the end of the day, impact the customer, which is cool. Let's talk a little bit about the brokers. That's the, that's the sort of the eat what you kill culture that you knew very well before you started this company. Uh, landlords are grappling with, my God, what is my asset worth? I can't really figure it out right now. Maybe I wait. 
maybe a lot of things change. Brokers, however, are, are sort of creatures of transactions. They need transactions to keep, you know, stay in the business. Uh, what do you, what are you guys seeing in terms of your conversations with them? Uh, are they, are they suddenly learning how to do things a different way? I, I don't think it's not just the brokers, the owners as well. Hmm. I think most of them have kind of looked at looked at 2020 and said, okay, we have time, right? We're usually really busy. We have time. Let's spend this time kind of catching up on all these other things that we didn't do before. And a lot of that was around technology. Like I'll, I'll use BTS for an example. There, there, you know, we've got in most of the major markets, 70 to 90% of the market uses BTS. Yeah. However, within those companies, not every kind of important person was living on BTS because they would say, I can walk outside my office and they're all right. I'll ask whoever I want to. Yeah. When that goes away, well, guess what? Your world changes overnight, right? right? And so it became a necessity. Like I, the way that I look at 2020 for the brokerage community and for owners, um, it, it's almost kind of like the golden age of software for them. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, you know, if, if, if the past five years was the golden age of, of TV for with Netflix and Hulu, that just happened for real estate because mm-hmm. what COVID did was prove that the way that you did things does not work anymore and it won't work. Where does your product go from here? I mean, are you, what, what's the evolution of it? As I said, we, we started this journey for you on video tours, right? Now you're completely different. What, what's, what are some of the other elements that you're interested in? Maybe you're just thinking about at the moment. Yeah. So, so let's just talk for a minute about, you know, about what the VTS operating system looks like today. Cause to your point, you know, when we, when we first talked a long time ago, it was very different, right? It was like the very, 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 very top of the funnel. Interesting, um, you're calling it an OS. I, I think that's a it's an interesting way to think about it. I haven't heard it. Yeah, that, that's that's what we call it, right? And it, it is kind of like the 2.0 of what we do. Um, now that we have the complete product, and I, I would have called it that in 2012 when we raised our first first dollar, but again, it wasn't. It was it was we had a vision of getting there. And the big change that I've, I kind of talked to the company about is like, I don't want to call this a vision anymore because it's now real, right? It's like we've, now it's, this is what we are. Um, but if, if you think about what you do in VTS today, and this is totally unique to us. One, in our platform, you can actually understand the pulse of a market, right? VTS knows more about tenant demand in real time than anyone else in the world. Um, and we can tell you, how fast it's coming back, at what pace, who are those companies, the size ranges, is that changing? For deals being negotiated, what do those rents look like? Are TIs going up? That's all, no one else can give you that data. So you can use that information as an owner to really set your building strategy or decide, do I wanna invest in that, in that specific market or do we wanna get out of that market? Mm-hmm. So let's, let's stay with the building for a second, right? You set your strategy. In that same platform in VTS, you don't just set your strategy from a marketing perspective, right? You've decided I want to pre-build this floor, not that one. I'm going to price it here because the data tells me that's what we should do. But I'm going to actually deploy my strategy from a marketing perspective in that same platform, right? And you do that through our marketplace, through all of our marketing functionality, and you're going to touch everybody. You're also tracking in that platform all that kind of digital activity in real time, mm-hmm. which leads are hot, which are cold. And when those leads turn to an actual deal, well, you track that in our leasing platform, right? That's what we do. Typically what would happen, right? Is once that lease was signed, our work was kind of done, yep. you know, that was it. Yep. But now with Ted and engagement, you stay with the customer, mm-hmm. right? And you get to actually monitor their happiness and do things to give them a better experience in the asset. So that when it is time for renewal, you know, a probability of renewal, probably six months before you would have. Just based on how, so that, that, when I say OS, kind of that's where it is. So as I think about kind of where we go, one, our data, like our, our proprietary unique market data is going to live everywhere, right? In every part of our OS, there will be market data to help you understand how am I doing versus the market? And is this a good decision? Um, we think that a modern platform should do that. I think two, there are kind of subcategories within that operating system. Right. So there are there are kind of other branches you can go into on kind of the marketing side. There are other branches within leasing. Uh, and so we're our, our challenge is to figure out which of those we build versus which ones we buy. You talked about you made this really interesting thing about like the landlord can look asset level at this building and start start slicing and dicing it differently. Is anyone doing that on a broader scale? Say, hey, OK, I found that, I don't know, the third floor of my building is actually great for a flex office. 
yeah, yeah. what? I own a hundred buildings. Let's try this in, in sure. like multiple locations at once. Cause that's the powerful thing that I think you could get at. Maybe. No, I, yeah. And I wish I can give you names because you'd be blown away, but like, I think our data itself has supported a few billion dollars over the last four months of refinancings of, um, asset strategies from like, to your point, do we pre-build this floor? Do we do flex or do we keep it raw? This financing thing to me is fascinating. Is it talk a little bit about that. Like you're saying they're able to use, they can go to a bank or a CMBS lender or whatever and say, these are the inside, like our lenders now, do they even understand what they're looking at when it comes to that? It's a, it's an entirely new data set for our industry. We didn't have a real-time view into demand. It was like we had comps, which is largely a tenant who was in the market a year ago. So while it's not totally worthless, it's not, it's in no way a forward looking indicator. Um, what we have are the forward looking data points. So for owners, you're constantly kind of battling with investors or internal folks or lenders to talk about, listen, here's what's happening today, but what you didn't have were any kind of material trends to show what's going to happen. Yeah. And that's what people really want. And so whether you're doing a refinancing or you're trying to decide if you should renew someone early at a certain rent, you know, we, we have the data to tell you or support that you should or shouldn't do that. Um, and it's new. You don't want the situation where it's, you know, office spacey where you, you kind of just take the figures and hand them over to someone. Totally. You know? We, we probably would have slower rolled this product, mm -hmm. um, had it not been for COVID, but what COVID did and, and, you know, while, you know, it was a, a, a terrible thing for our industry, maybe more than almost any other industry um, in the world. The only silver lining for us was our customers needed us more than they'd ever needed us. And so, you know, and, and it meant it meant going to our board and our investors and saying, hey, remember that budget we had? Hmm. We have to rip it up. And I know you're probably scared that, you know, that it, it may be a bleak year for software companies, especially those in real estate, but we're telling you, we have never seen this much activity with our customers in our nine or 10 years of doing this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the nice things about our business and how we've run it is we always took the high road of optimizing for running an efficient, really good business, not growing, not kind of growth at all costs where you're constantly raising money. We, we've actually never needed money in any round we've done of, of fundraising, um, which is where you, it's, it's a place of strength, right? When you do that. And so because of that, we've kind of earned, earned the trust of our investors. And so when we said, I need an extra $10 million this year, they would say, we trust you, go do it. There's been some heartening signs on that front, right? I mean, if you look at some of these, uh, I mean, real estate SPACs are all the rage right now. You're seeing, you know, a bunch of really... What's it called? A SPAC? <laughs> SPAC. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? But like you have states, uh, states title going public, open doors going public. Uh, I don't saw know a new one today, happened. OfferPad. Yeah. So, so there is definitely, in, you know, investor interest in this space. I yeah. guess the, how patient is the capital that you're working with? I mean, what what's sort of the uh, what's sort of the end game for them? Yeah, I think listen, they're they're patient. We're we're a high growth business that has a data, a customer base, and a software platform that no one else has. So we're we're in a really nice spot. Um, we've we've kind of earned we've earned their patience. Is kind of what I'm saying. Um, but they're also really smart. Right. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're keeping a very close eye on the market. I think the correction we saw a couple of weeks ago um, was meaningful. Right. If you, if you look at the multiples of where things were trading, it's a down about it was it was down about 35 percent. Now it's down about 25. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there probably needed to be a bit of a correction. It'll be it'll be really interesting to see kind of where things end up. Um, and then I think then that allows you as a company to really decide, okay, you know, do we go out, do, you know, do, do we go public? Do we kind of continue our current growth trajectory? Maybe do a, a private round if we need to. Okay, so now you have people like, you know, we talked about, you, you had Blackstone early on, that was quite big for you guys. Then you had someone like Fifth Wall coming in, et cetera. Who else is interested now? Who else outside, like, who else is interested in these kind of businesses? Well, now it's everybody, right? Like Pr PropTech now has a real seat at the table. Okay which it didn't have, which is awesome. Every single venture fund has some percentage of that fund that is allocated towards PropTech, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty awesome. So I think what, what, what's great about what is happening with all this SPAC stuff is you're going to have PropTech companies that are public, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's good for all PropTech companies. It, it takes the kind of legacy 
you know, long Wall Street investor and gets them into our space. Mm -hmm. So it's your question around like what's what investors would be next. You, know, you start talking to like the long hedge funds, right? The um, the Black Rocks of the world, the folks who are now investing in a lot of these SPACs and, and also just want to put money to work in real estate tech mm -hmm. for like and be in the on the ride for a long time. Um, that didn't exist five years ago, right? That's, that is new. All, right? like, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see that. Because even your Blackstone investment, I mean, it was not much money, but it was just the, the sort of the name and the interest. What was it? Uh, yeah, our, our claim to fame, and I, I bet they'd say the same. It's like, it was the smallest investment they've ever made, but it was like the highest profile. <laughs> okay. Where like John Gray was involved at the time, yeah. Lawrence Tosi, who was a CFO, who became Airbnb CFO, was involved. So it was like, we were like, you know, so excited about it. And we're like, for them, it was like $3 million. What? Who cares? But they all cared. Uh -huh. um, and so, and they're doing really well on that. That, that. that number is much bigger now. I ask you every time I speak to you, are you probably? No, no, we don't want to be. <laughs> we're growing too fast. Okay. Any, any path to what, what's any timeline on it? It's not. No, I mean, we can, listen, we, we can, we can lever down growth at any point and be profitable, right? The business, our, our, our net retention of our customers is, is, you know, best in class. Uh, our churn is the lowest of, of, you know, most enterprise software companies. So like we're, we're in a really great spot where if, if profitability was really important, that's a, that we can do it in short order, but the market's not valuing that, right? Like all these kind of public companies you're seeing the, the multiples are all about the growth, right? It's not really a value game right now. Um, and so for us, it's, it's about growing, you know, as fast as we can, as efficiently as we can. Um, and so we, we could probably grow faster, but it would increase burn to a point where I wouldn't be super comfortable. Um, and you're not doing private jets and anything at this point, I hope. No. That'd be great. But no. Is there a potential to take what you guys have built, that the interactivity, that customer base, that knowledge, and let's say plug it into multifamily, into industrial, into even God forbid retail? Is there any is there any <laughs> yeah, we have there, I mean that? We have billions of square feet right now using BTS for retail and industrial. Okay. Um, those are two big asset classes for us. And they're very different right now for, for, for almost the same reason, right? Like retail obviously is, is in a really tough place. It was in a tough place before COVID. This was kind of like the salt in the wound. Um, and so our growth in retail is primarily because they just need to do what they can to stay closer to their customer uh, to find opportunities, right? Because there's not a whole lot of them right now. Um, industrial is growing for the inverse reason. The same reasons that retail is getting hurt, industrial is on fire, right? Like e-com is just exploding industrial and blowing up retail. Right. Um, and so it's funny how they, they have very different use cases, but nonetheless need software. Right? At, the, at the rate at which industrial owners are growing their portfolios, what they don't want to do is have to hire the equivalent amount of people to manage that portfolio, yeah. right? Every 10 buildings, I don't need 10 people. I want three but software helps me do the rest. What's um, cool about industrial to me is that it's the ownership is even more consolidated in a way, like for sure, Logis, Blackstone, and maybe a couple others who really have a lock in, in the way that in office buildings, there's really no one who has no. so much of the market. But I think Blackstone is one of the best in the world at is getting conviction on a space and then just going and saying, we're going to own that. Like, you know, Link, which is their industrial arm is like two years old, right? Mm -hmm. So like within two years, they've built, the number one or two biggest industrial platform in the world, right? right? So like that, that, that kind of can't happen in office. Um, and which is that, pretty cool. when you're at that kind of scale, it's so interesting what you can do, right? You could just, you can bet on a space and then go into it. And then in a year you're unrecognizable, right? So I think, yeah, that's well, if, if, if you can't think of a reason why of something that would devalue it, then why wouldn't you? Like, I, I don't know what that, like I, I've asked the, the Blackstone team and, and others like, what could possibly make industrial slow down? If like Amazon was broken up. Amazon is the only thing probably that could maybe Im like materially impact it. We have an industrial advisory board that meets every month, okay. um, our customers. And, you know, you, you go from like that call to the office or, or retail call. It's very different. You know, the industrial folks are like, when we send an LOI out. Mm -hmm. We tell the tenant, if you don't sign by Friday, the, the price goes up. Like that's the level of demand they have, right? That is not the conversation anywhere else. What kind of conversation would you have with a, a class, you know, a landlord who owns a major class B building on 6th Avenue? So unsexy into two, basically. It says, 
hey, Nick, walk through my space. What can I do? What, what options do I have at this point? Because now they're, to your point, competing with a lot of class A, great office space on the sublease market. What kind of conversations would you, would you think they're having or would you have with them? One, I would ask them kind of what, how are they building their strategy, right? Like what, what data are you using to actually decide in this building that might be old, if you've got two floors coming available, how are you making the decision to kind of divide those floors up or finishes to put in? Because, you know, people like VTS can now tell you in this submarket, demand looks like this. Let's build this, this space, this specific way and capture that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're a class B owner or a trophy asset owner, you are now going to be building and executing a strategy based on real market demand. Now, the reality is not everybody acts on that information. So the folks who do are always going to win. Um, but I would probably say, you know, for, for the folks who think that they can kind of sit back and go back to normal, I can tell you as someone who has a front row seat to the folks who aren't thinking that way, you're going to get smashed. Like the things that the owners are doing with our data and other data sets to, to really make decisions and change the way they operate are material. It will be, it'll be, it's, it's, it's competitively unfair if you are sitting back and your next door neighbor is doing what we know they're doing, you're gonna get smashed. It's gonna, it'll be a bloodbath for you. We'll end on that highly optimistic note. This has been another edition of the Real Estate Interview with me, Hatan Simtani. My guest today was Nick Romito. He's the CEO and co-founder of VTS, one of the leading companies in the commercial real estate tech space. Thank you to our sponsor, Markham LLP. And Nick, thank you. This has been a pleasure as always.